Revel, uh, Revelation 5, actually I want you to go to Ezekiel 8 and 9, um, because I remembered that we were setting up for something, and the purpose of the seal of God. Question I always like to ask people, especially in the house of God, wherever I go, are, do you know that you're born again? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're saved? Um, this is tornado season. We're not, we're not above getting tornadoes here in this area. Uh, anything could happen and you know, you're driving around, all of a sudden some idiot pulls out in front of you and hits your car. Uh, any one of us could die instantly or in a matter of days by something. You never guaranteed another day in this world. That's something that I've learned over the years. And the question is, are you, are you born again? God's judgment and God's wrath is going to be poured out on this entire world one of these days. There are times when God judges a particular place or a particular people for whatever the reason. God always has a reason for it. Usually the wrath of God, well, I would say always, the wrath of God is never survivable. You can't dig a bunker deep enough for God not to be able to find you, God not to be able to pour down your wrath. In fact, when it comes to that, uh, there's a YouTube channel I watch. These things kind of are neat to me. It's this guy down in, I think he's in Texas, and he builds and installs underground bunkers for people. And they're livable. You can get in there and they've got generators and gas tanks and water tanks and sewage and you can store enough food in there for a year and they've got um, what they call NBC air filters, which is uh, chemical, biological or nuclear air filters that'll either run on electric power or you can crank them and pull in clean air. And God says in um, the last chapter of Amos, he says, though you descend down into the depths of the earth, I'm going to bring you back up. Though thou ascend into heaven, I'm going to pull you back down. He says the same thing right in the next page in Obadiah. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou build thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So no matter where you are, God is going to know where you are and he's going to find you. And if, and if you have been appointed to God's wrath, you are going to receive God's wrath no matter what. And um, come on in. We're talking about wrath. So you might as well get in on this, all right? Uh, and this deals with the seal of God. So I'm going to read what I have up on the screen to get into that. In Revelation 7, um, let me read the first verse because God specifically holds back the, the angels who are in control of the four winds. And he says in verse 1 of Revelation 7, After these things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And if you look, and I know I have this in my note, that, well, Revelation 14, I looked and lo, a lamb stood in Mount Zion, having with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And if you look in Revelation 9, Revelation 9, the fifth trumpet sounds. And a, a, John said he saw a star fall from heaven. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opens the pit, and verse 3 says, There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not 
the seal of God in their foreheads. So this seal of God is protection. Who gives the seal of God? God does. And I, and I emphasize again, it's not a church that seals you. It's not a church that tells you you're saved or you're not saved. It's not a minister. It's not a man. It's not a pope, a priest, a rabbi. It's not a man that can tell you you're saved or you're not saved. It's not a woman that can tell you you're saved or you're not saved. It's not the government who can do that. It is no earthly institution or thing that can tell you beyond any doubt that you are saved, born again, you are going to heaven. It is God and God alone. Because when God begins to pour out his wrath, he will do so upon those whom he has not sealed. And he will know the difference. So, back in Ezekiel 8. I mentioned this, I, I kind of ran through this a little bit quickly last Sunday but I want you to look in verse 5 John, uh, God takes Ezekiel through the temple and he shows him things that are going on inside of the, the house of God in Jerusalem things that probably most people don't know about or are not aware of I think if we were to find out what happens in the private meetings in the headquarters of denominations in this country, we would probably be very disappointed at what we heard. I think, in fact, I know that there is not a single denomination in this country, or I would say anywhere in the world, that does not have a serious, either a morality problem or a doctrinal problem. Serious ones. Spiritual wickedness going on in high places. So, like in verse 5, He said unto me, Son of man, lift up the, thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy. This is a statue to a god. An image of jealousy in the entry. And he said, furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Who in here has ever been in the old cathedral in downtown St. Louis? first walk in the door, there's a, there's a little bowl there of water. That's supposed to be holy water. And then, and what you're, what you're supposed to do is dip your fingers in that water and you're supposed to cross yourself. That's supposed, now listen to this, that is supposed to make you holy enough to walk in that church. And then almost as soon as you go in, there's a statue of Mary right there for you to pray to. You're going to pray to Mary as you go into what they call the house of the Lord. That's exactly what you have here. And then look at verse 7. He brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. They had decorated the temple of God with all of these beast, devil gods that they were praying to, that they were worshiping, and remember, this is the house of God. This is the God, or this is the house God said, wherein I have put my name. He, this particular temple, uh, Solomon's temple, 
when Solomon had the Ark of the Covenant brought in, the Bible says that the glory of the Lord came in that place in, the, in a cloud, and he said the glory was so great that no man could stand inside of the temple because of the presence of God inside of that place. That's how holy that temple was at that time. But compare now, that Solomon's day, compare that with what we have now in this same building. It has decayed and gotten more and more corrupt to the point to where now they've got all these pagan gods, all these false gods all around, worshiping them, praying to them, burning incense to them, and so on. And then he said in verse 11, There stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And then the 70 men were the men, this, this goes all the way back to the day when Moses was still alive. And Jethro, his father-in-law, said, Moses, it's not good that you sit and judge every little matter amongst so many people. Why don't you appoint elders over the house of Israel? It was called the Sanhedrin, but it was the 70 elders that helped rule over the people of Israel. Well, these 70, these are your politicians. These are your judges. These are the people who bear rule in this country that are so corrupt. They win votes by telling you what you want to hear. But then when they get elected, are they going to do what the will of the people is? Clearly not. Clearly not. Uh, Tim Barron's informed me of a movie it's a documentary film. It's out in certain theaters now. Um, and it's, what was it called? 2,000 Mules? Have you seen it? I haven't seen it yet. I got to remember this is going on YouTube. It deals with that thing that I can't talk about on YouTube. Corruption, absolute corruption in this country, the likes of which we have never seen before in the history of this nation. Tammany Hall and Chicago are nothing compared to what's going on now. So we have the 70, the ancients of the house of Israel in verse 11. And in the midst of them stood Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. In other words... Yeah, we believe in God, but he's not really here for our affairs now. We can do whatever we want. Uh, there is a similar doctrine going around. Uh, Pastor Mike Hutzel told me about this. And someone that he is very closely related to has fallen into this error. They call it extreme grace. And I think it probably stems from Calvinism. And to me, it's the, it's the likely fruit of Calvinism that says, because God has saved you and because that salvation is permanent and there's nothing that you can do against salvation, if you have an affair, so what? If you want to drink alcohol, so what? If you want to look at online junk that you shouldn't look at, so what? Don't even have to repent. You don't have to be sorry. God automatically forgives it, and there is nothing you can do that'll make God angry or nothing you can do that'll cause God to come against you in any way 
you have extreme grace from God. You have grace that covers every sin that you commit. So basically, commit all the sins that you want to. God's going to cover them no matter what. That's almost like saying, God doesn't care how I live my life and what I do. Is what that's saying. And folks, that will lead you to hell very quickly. That idea will lead you to hell very quickly. And so anyway, uh, verse 13, he said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Now it's, it's worse. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was referred to as the dying God. There's all these, all throughout history, these gods that were like fake messiahs. Because in somehow, some way, they were sacrificed or they were killed for the sake of other people like Jesus and these women weeping for Tammuz is exactly where the Catholic Church and even some Protestant churches get the idea of Lent it is supposed to be like 40 days of fasting 40 days of prayer 40 days of doing without and so you know the Catholic way is if I'm going to have to spend 40 days without something the night before the 40 days starts I'm going to do it all which is called Fat Tuesday Mardi Gras so on Mardi Gras there's hedonism drunkenness nudity drugs partying you name it fulfilling all the desires of the flesh because for 40 days we're not going to do any of that stuff yeah right who believes that but that's what they're doing they're weeping for tamas because tamas is dead and they believe that they can pray and weep for him and through their prayers will raise him back up from the dead verse 15 then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again. Thou shalt see greater abominations than these. It's, getting, it's going to get worse now. And it brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the, Lord, of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men. Remember that the number of size of the group is getting smaller. That's because we're getting to the top. The very, very elite of the people of Israel. I don't like elitism. I don't like people who, when they are around you, they let you know that they do believe that they are better than you. I just don't like people like that. I don't like to be in their presence. I don't like to hear them talk. I don't like anything about them. Because I know for a fact that they're nothing but a dirty, filthy, rotten sinner, the exact same as me. They're not any better than me. Amen? That's what you have. You have the elite here, the Harvard graduates, okay? The people who have the PhDs, the, the pastors who have PhDs, they are doctor so and so. I just don't go for that. I was offered, I was offered a uh, honorary doctorate, and I, I and on a more and more than on more than one occasion, and I said no, 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 don't want it, don't want anything to do. I don't want you to call me doctor, call me whatever, hoggy. Uh, I've heard it all, believe it or not. So they're at the, verse 16, they're at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar. We're about five and twenty men and their backs toward the temple of the Lord with their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. They've got it all wrong. They've got their back turned to God and they're facing the opposite direction. They've turned their back to God, not their face and they're not looking 
toward God and toward his righteousness, looking for the sun God. Verse 17, then, said, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Fury is a big word for God. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have. That, that, that reminds me of that tornado I watched go through that town in Kansas. That tornado did not care how expensive the house was that it destroyed, did it? It'll go through trailer parks and it'll go through subdivisions where people's houses are $750,000, a million dollars. It doesn't care whose house it destroys, does it? That's God's fury. Um, I will deal with fury. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. And you say, man, God's, God's pretty mean, isn't he? Can you imagine the number of people who were beating on the side of the ark? Noah, let us in! Let us in, Noah! Noah couldn't let him in. He didn't shut the door. God did. God shut the door. And for Noah and his family to sit there for the first few hours at least, hearing people trying to get into the ark, but it was too late. And there's going to come a day, you might want to tell your loved ones this, you might want to tell your friends this. You might want to tell people that you work with this. You can laugh at me. You can say that all of us church people are hypocrites. You can make up whatever you want to about Christianity and the Bible and Jesus dying on the cross. But one of these days you're going to find out that I wasn't lying and on the day you find that out, it will probably be too late for you. And you can say, I realized that one day. That's why I gave my life to the Lord years ago. Instead of thinking that I could wait until the day that it happens and then get my heart right with God. Because to those who are not saved, he comes, how? As a thief. But brethren, that day should not overtake us as a thief. We'll be ready, won't we? We'll be ready. They won't be. So look, look now what happens in Ezekiel 9. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. Um, and one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's ink horn by his side. He literally had the horn of like a goat or an ox or something like that, hollowed out, and it was full of ink. And he had a writer's ink horn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. In verse 3, And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink horn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. The midst of Jerusalem is where the government is. It's where the temple is. It's all the, where the religious executives are. The elite of Jerusalem. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark 
upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now, what is he saying here? What kind of people are these that sigh and cry for the abominations? Huh? They're the righteous. Does it make you cry to see what is going on in our country? The ministry of truth now. Telling America what's true and what's not true. That's, listen, that is what Adolf Hitler did. That's what Joseph Goebbels' job was. Was to tell everybody what to believe. And everybody fell in line with that. We believe what Hitler and Goebbels tells us to believe. We believe the Jews are bad. We believe that we need to take over the, the, most of Europe. We need to believe this. We need to believe that. And we can't believe this. And we can't believe that. Even the clergy, even the ministers fell for it. Because those were men who had nice little well-paid, cushy jobs that knew that if they went against the Nazi party, they would lose their job, they would lose their house, they might even lose their life. So they went along with the lies that Hitler and Goebbels spread. Soviet Union had TASS, the news agency. It had Pravda, the, news, the official newspaper of the Communist Party in Russia. And do you think they did, did the Soviet Union tell its people the truth about Chernobyl and what happened there? Do you know that about the same time we sent Apollo 11 to land on the moon, the Russians also sent a crew to the moon to try to beat us there, but they missed the moon. They missed. And they went lost in space and died out there. Did that ever show up in the Soviet newspapers? No. So do you think that this government is going to tell you the truth? Absolutely not a chance. Not a chance. And so anyway, um, let's see here. Where were we? That was chapter 9. Yeah. Yeah. The people that cry for the abominations are the ones who are saddened to see the condition that the temple has gotten into, that the holy city has gotten into, that the king has gotten into. They are, they're, they're, the religious leaders have all fallen and gone astray. And they're praying, God, deliver us. God, send us revival. And then he said, now, he's going to put a mark on their head. Now, this is not the mark of the beast. This is a, this is a Old Testament representation of the seal of God in their foreheads. If we if, remember back in um, Revelation 14, the 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. So we're not told what kind of mark it was, but it was something that designated them as being saved and righteous and separated them from everybody else. Because, verse 5, And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite, and let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young both maids that's uh, the word maid implies like young ladies 10 12 13 year old young ladies little children and women because but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Hold your place there. Turn to 1 
Peter 4. First Peter 4, look at verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin where? The house of God. Isn't that fair? Isn't God being fair here? He can't judge the rest of the world without first judging his own people. Wouldn't be fair for God to go out and knock down everybody else in the world and then let church people just get by with whatever they're doing. Wouldn't be right. So God says, he says it here. See, these are two witnesses. Well, you have one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. They're both telling you the exact same thing. That when God begins to do this, he's starting in the churches first. All the... All the, I think he's going to start with the preachers first in the church. All the preachers that are drunkards, all the preachers that are adulterers, fornicators, sodomites, thieves, all the preachers that have turned their back on prayer, study of the Word of God, chasing after popularity, chasing after what brings in a crowd, not wanting to offend everybody. God's, I think God's going after them first. Then he's going after the deacons. Then he's going after the trustees. Then he's going to start in the front pews on the right side first. And Chris is laughing because like, yeah, look at David switching side. Yeah, it's just like a Democrat. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. But do you see what, look at what he's doing. He's saying here, slay him, kill him. And he said, uh, verse 7, defile the house and fill the courts with slain. Go you forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in the pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city is full of perverseness. For they said, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head." Behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. We, we now have the opportunity in this country to outlaw abortion in most of the states of this country. And I, I pray that God will spare the heart of this nation if he has to pour out his wrath upon California and Hyannis port. Let him do it. Amen? Let's stop killing babies in our yard. Amen? Because if we can't change California and Oregon, Washington and Massachusetts and all them other places, if we can't change them, fine, let them be that way. But they're going to deal with the wrath of God. Father, we thank you, God, that you have sealed us. And Father, I do weep. I love my country. I love the people. I love the land. Lord, I traveled yesterday, or the day before, and I saw the beautiful, beautiful country. And Lord, it's just great to see what a wonderful, fertile land you've given us. Father, we thank you for blessing this nation the way you have. But Lord, there are those who are still intent upon sinning and living in sin and snubbing you and spitting in your face and taking the miracle of 
birth and conception and destroying that. Father, we pray for their souls. Lord, if they won't change, Lord, then bring your wrath down upon them and let the rest of the world see it and say, surely their God is the Lord God of heaven. Bless your word today. Bless these people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.